Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us here this morning. My name is Samantha Beacott. I'm the president of the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation, and I'm joining you from Treaty 6 territory and the traditional lands of the Métis. Uh, again, thank you for uh, continuing to uh, join us on this journey, continuing to um, represent the issues and, and shine a light on the issues that teachers and students are facing across the province. The Saskatchewan party government is continuing to refuse to engage in good faith bargaining, and they are acting as if they can ignore this dispute and it will simply go away. Their decisions have created this problem. Through the last two rounds of collective bargaining, we saw government push the issues of class complexity to committees. Teachers knew this was a way that they were trying to avoid solving the issues that students and teachers are facing in classrooms across our province. And we cannot wait any longer to have these issues addressed. We have seen a generation of kids impacted by the decisions government has made and the lack of supports available in schools. While bargaining remains at an impasse, we do actually agree with government on at least two things. First, we've heard the Minister of Education acknowledge that class complexity needs to be addressed and that another committee isn't the place for that. This is a shift from their position that we have seen over the last seven years in the last two rounds of collective bargaining. If this minister and this government are really committed to addressing class complexity, we wonder why they're so hesitant to enshrine that into agreement with teachers and school divisions. The second thing that we agree on is that our province is very diverse. There are unique challenges in each of the school divisions and each of the schools across our province. The decisions around how to best support students are best made at the local level, but those decisions are also strengthened when teacher voice is included in that process. School divisions need assurances that they will have the funding available to meet the needs of students in their schools, but they also need to be listening to teachers in that process and ensuring they're accurately understanding the impacts that class complexity are having in classrooms that they serve. We're ready to work with school divisions and government to find those solutions that are in the best interests of students and teachers across the province, but we cannot continue to bargain with ourselves. We'll happily return to the bargaining process as soon as we hear that the government trustee bargaining team has been empowered by government to begin negotiations. When we had last inquired, the GTBC hadn't received new instructions for bargaining. The minister can call me at any time. I have said that before publicly and the chair of our bargaining committee can communicate with our chair to let us know that they're ready to take this process seriously. Yesterday, we announced a second full day rotating strike taking place on Wednesday, February 7th in the following areas. All of Creighton School Division, all of Northern Lights School Division, all of Prairie Spirit School Division, all of Greater Saskatoon Catholic School Division, and all of Saskatoon Public School Division. As well, the Conseil de Col Francisco schools within the geographic boundaries of the school divisions that I mentioned, and the Saskatchewan Distance Learning Centre teachers who work at schools or regional campuses within the geographic boundaries. Today, we are also announcing a province-wide withdrawal of noon hour supervision on Thursday, February 8th. Teachers will be leaving their buildings during their scheduled noon hour. Teachers often, and all teachers, provide many supports over their lunch break. These services are voluntary as they're not part of their professional responsibilities of teachers that are legislated in the Education Act. Ensuring student safety is a school division responsibility. School divisions create plans ensuring students are supervised, often relying on teachers to provide this service, but there is no requirement that the supervision is provided by teachers. Teachers also provide extra services that are voluntary as well. They provide extra help for students who need a little bit more support in their instruction. They provide uh, support for noon hour intramurals. They plan activities. They have extracurricular activities that happen over the noon hour as well as they complete planning and preparation for instruction. Government has provided us with a take it or leave it offer. offer. And after nine months of negotiations, and conciliation and job action from teachers, they have not engaged in any negotiations and remain firm on that opening offer. Their disengagement in the process is absolutely disrespectful to students and teachers, and it shows their lack of commitment to address these issues in the long term. We recognize that these job actions impact students and their families, but it doesn't have to be this way. 
teachers don't want to be taking these actions. So I want to thank everyone the support for the support that has been shown throughout January and now into February. We've seen tens of thousands of emails been sent to MLAs and the Minister of Education and the Premier of Saskatchewan. If you are concerned, and I'm a parent, I am concerned too, please continue to reach out to your MLA and your school board trustees. Students and teachers deserve to know that their learning and working environments will see improvements, not just in one-time pilots, but in long-term commitments that support all students and teachers across Saskatchewan. So thank you for joining me today. I'd be happy to take uh, some questions if you raise your hand. I see Alec. Hey there. Uh, I guess just to start with, uh, when did you last reach out to the GTBC? Uh, our last communication with the GTBC was uh, last week or the end of the week prior, I believe. Okay. Um, and, and I suppose the withdrawal of noon hour supervision for one day and now rotating strikes um, happening as well. I, I, I'm curious if there's, what, what's the strategy essentially that you're meaning to employ? Because I'm wondering why you haven't essentially ramped up some of the tactics, work to rule, uh, additional uh, province-wide strikes, et cetera. Why, why is it that you're taking this strategy here and now? Oh, well, there's lots of factors that go into the consideration of what actions we are going to take. In the end, our goal is to get back to the table and negotiate an agreement. Uh, it is unfortunate that we have to continue to take additional actions. Um, government can end this at any point. I know you asked when was the last time we reached out. Um, we continue to reach out and we continue to uh, check in with them, but it's their decision to change their position. Uh, they need to be ready to negotiate. We have communicated clearly time and time again throughout, like I said, the last nine months that we want to negotiate. We want to have a back and forth. Uh, nothing that we have put forward is a demand. We've provided lots of different ways that these uh, issues can be addressed, but government remains firm in their position. So when they're ready to change their position, I would encourage them to reach out to us uh, and as well, we'll continue to check in with them. But uh, when they're ready to, to move this process forward, I would be happy to take that phone call at any time. Okay, I got you. And, and I guess just given that there does appear to be significant public support for the STF right now, the, the Incitrix poll saw that the 31% of respondents that were affected, something like 68% of them had a uh, far greater appreciation of or, or approval of the STF's actions. So I suppose it, it does that not kind of buoy you to or encourage you to maybe continue to engage in the province wide strikes that you, you had previously engaged in? And we recognize that those actions do have a significant impact on students and their families across the province. And, and that's not our goal. We want to be in our classrooms. We want to be supporting our students. But we need help in, in that. We need government to recognize the problems and make long-term commitments. So uh, nothing is off of the table at this point. But we're hoping that the government starts taking this seriously before uh, additional actions have to be taken before Wednesday or Thursday come even, and and we can start negotiating, uh, and they can start negotiating in good faith. And last one for me, we, we should be having a budget next month, I do believe. If if there's a, a massive whack of money, just a whole tranche of new funding to address class size and complexity at the school uh, division level, why? I suppose I'm asking you for a little bit of a hypothetical here, but you, you frequently said that one-time funding pilot programs aren't enough. Why why is it important to have this as part of a contract as opposed to the sort of immediate top-ups or immediate uh, surges of cash funding? Well, the one-time fundings are problematic because uh, school divisions can't adequately, adequately make decisions around uh, human resources supports that are needed, like extra staff or extra teachers, extra EAs, mental health counselors. When it's one-time funding, they can only hire those individuals for one year. Um, and so it's difficult to, to fill staffing in that way. It doesn't also provide consistency for students because just because uh, the funding is there for one year doesn't mean that students' needs are only there for one year. We need to have predictable and sustainable funding. Um, and actually, we've been predicting that there might be a big announcement coming in the education budget and other public sector budgets as well. This is a pre-election budget, and uh, I would not be surprised if there was 
additional funds that were provided for education and, and we would welcome those funds. But we've also experienced significant clawbacks to the education budget. Um, the government, this government, took $54 million out of education in one year previously. And, and that has really um, been such a catalyst to the issues that we have we have experienced now for for the last seven years for sure. So we need to ensure that whatever funding comes this year, whatever commitment government is making, that it's going to continue beyond uh, beyond an election. It's going to continue for um, several years so that we can really start to address the needs that we see from students in our classrooms. Thanks, Samantha. Thank you, Alec. Moira? Hi, thank you. Um, I'm thank wondering, the, uh, the Nutrien Wonder Hub and other groups are offering kids camps during this planned job action. Um, some say they should not do that because it undermines your job action efforts. Um, what do you think? Uh, well, children need to go somewhere. And, and when school isn't provided, um, it doesn't just mean that there's disruptions to learning. And to me, that's the biggest impact that is still occurring. Um, regardless of whether students get childcare from from another uh, avenue. So we do want students to be safe. We want them to to be under someone's care. Um, but it is still the learning that is missing on those days that that is having an impact um, in the longer term as well. So you don't see it as crossing the picket line to offer these services? No, they're not providing curricular instruction from from my understanding. They're not they're they're not filling the role of a teacher in in the sense of delivering a curriculum for students. It is childcare at that point. And that's not what teachers do. Teachers aren't aren't just uh, child care for students. I see. And, you know, can you expand a bit on um, you, your release mentioned the fees uh, that parents are charged to keep kids supervised at lunch hour, often by teachers? Um how much are teachers paid to do this? You know, are they expected to do it, even though it's voluntary? And uh, how much are our families paying for that? Uh, well, that payment is going to school divisions in order to create those plans. And as I said, there is no requirement that school divisions um, use teachers to provide the supervision, although many of them do rely on teachers to um, provide that service. Um, the compensation for teachers for noon hour supervision differs uh, widely across the province. Um, I don't know what a maximum might be, but there, there's kind of an average salary, I think, of $20 an hour. I've heard for that noon hour supervision. Um, some teachers, though, are compensated through um, hours to earn uh, uh, like a earned day off or, or a personal day. And so some of those might be that teachers have to provide 75 hours of additional service and that can be through noon hour supervision or extra cur to earn just one day off uh, throughout the school year that they can choose. I see and last from me, um, you know, are we looking at a full strike and and what are what is what is lunch hour going to look like for students on Thursday um, if their teachers aren't aren't there to watch them? Uh, so again, uh, there's nothing that is off the table at this point. We are we are focused on getting back to the table and and to start negotiations. We don't want to have further actions. We don't want to have further disruptions to student learning. Um, but we need government to engage in that process with us. Um, we're ready to do whatever it takes. And I continue to hear across the province, the teachers are are committed and ready to do whatever it takes to ensure that they see supports uh, and they see um, proper negotiations occur around um, many of the proposals that we have brought forward. And then in terms of what Thursday is going to look like, again, that's going to be different depending on what school divisions have put in place for plants. They might um, have parents come in and volunteer to supervise during the day. Um, I don't know specifically, but that would be a great question to ask to uh, school division directors of what they have in place. It's their responsibility to ensure students are are safe in their schools if they're remaining there. Alec? Yeah, I guess, um, what, what kind of interactions have you had with the SSBA uh, sort of leading up to this? Because They've they've not really released much of a statement with respect to the job action and whatnot. But if if funding is meant to be coming through them to address complexity 
and classroom composition. I'm just curious as to what kind of negotiations or what kind of discussions the SDF has had with the SSBA. Well, the government trustee bargaining team has representatives uh, for both government as well as the school boards. And so my communication uh, typically goes through the bargaining team to their, their bargaining team chair, which does include representation from Saskatchewan school boards. And then because School boards are, they really have their hands tied through all of this. They cannot set their own mill rate anymore. Um, while government likes to point the finger and say this is a school division issue for them to, to make better decisions around where they allocate their resources, they do not have the funding to make those decisions. And we've heard the president of the SSBA come out uh, and many school board chairs um, come out after previous budgets to say that the funding that they're providing isn't enough and that they also need predictable and sustainable funding. That's a message that we continue to share uh, throughout this entire process. When it comes to uh, pupils to teach in the province, I, I spoke to a student in PA today who said that she was in a class of about 40 people in her Science 10 class. I'm just curious if you can tell me what, what you've heard from members in terms of some of the larger classes that they've had to teach and really the impact that that has on students and that has on learning. Uh, absolutely. Definitely our large urban centers are seeing uh, very large class sizes, specifically in the high school. They're seeing classes of 40 or more in some sections. Um, in the younger grades, they might have a little bit lower classes. But again, still, I'm hearing from teachers across the province who have, uh, say, kindergarten classes of over 30. And I can't imagine um, trying to support. I'm a high school teacher um, from my previous roles. And so I can't imagine trying to uh, support 35 year olds or four or five year olds and then at the end of the year five six year olds um, in instruction and trying to to teach them routines and trying to teach them um, alphabet or their sounds and so that impact is significant in that uh, not only are you trying to deliver a curriculum, but then you also have increased needs uh, that aren't being met. And so those uh, needs fall on on the plate of teachers to try and um, be a, a counselor for students or try and provide additional speech support or reading interventions. And a teacher can't do everything um, when you have a reasonable number of students, it is not their their job to do all of those roles. And it's not, um, it's an impossible task really to do all of those roles. Even if we had all students at um, the the same grade level or, or ability level in terms of learning, it, it becomes more and more difficult to meet the needs of all of your students when you have large class sizes because uh, you don't get that one-on-one -on -one time. If you think of a high school class that has 40 or more students in it, even if you have only 20 minutes of instruction at the beginning of class or some point through class, every student is getting an average of one minute of the teacher's time one-on-one. -on -one. And that's, it's simply not enough. You can't build a, a connection with students in that way. You can't adequately support their needs or their learning needs in that way. Um, and so it, it is having a significant impact on, on student learning. And we see that compound year after year uh, as we have fewer and fewer supports in our schools. Thanks. That's all for me. Thank you. Moira, your hand is still up. Did you have another question? Nope. Sorry, no. I'll Put go it down. Ahead. Thanks for your time. Yep. Okay, so not seeing any other questions, and I don't see anything in the chat. So again, just wanted to thank everyone for joining us here today. Again, shining a light on uh, the issues that teachers have been talking about over the last several years. Uh, the issues that have a significant impact on our, our students as teachers and as parents across the province, our children. We want what is best for them and we want what is best for the future of Saskatchewan. So uh, from our perspective, there is no better investment that this government can make than in our children. They have not raised the issue of uh, funding. And actually, if you look at their messaging, uh, Saskatchewan is is doing significantly well compared to other other provinces and definitely other times. So if at a time of prosperity, we're not investing in our children, I wonder when this government will ever do it. Uh, we need to have assurances that we will see proper funding for public education, uh, not just one year, but for years to come so that we support all generations of kids as they go through our public schools. So again, thank you for your time um, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.